somebody that you work with may benefit from developing a double body weight back squat that would enhance their ability to throw. Good morning, happy Wednesday. I have Neural Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, well, today is Wednesday. That means that tomorrow is Thursday, which means 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. The Coffee and Coaches Conference call, as usual, I say this every time because it is true. Um, these calls are getting better and better. Um, the questions are getting better. We've got a great group of people. So uh, please join us at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link will be on my professional Facebook page just prior to the call. Uh, today's Q&A is uh, with Drew Keel from the QB Docs podcast. And so uh, Drew and I talked for about two hours um, a couple weeks ago and we recorded the whole thing. This is just one small segment where we were talking about a, a framework of how we would, would train a thrower. While we, we want to base everything that we do on principles, we don't know the outcomes. So there's a very specific way that we would implement certain strategies for training um, and determine based on the outcomes whether we're following the appropriate process or not. So this kind of outlines how you might do that. So I think you could probably take this and apply it in any um, training environment. But uh, again, this is one that's specific for throwers. So if you do work with throwers, um, again, Drew works with quarterbacks almost exclusively. Um, this will be a really good one for you. If you would like to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put 15-minute consultation in the subject line so I don't delete it, and we will arrange that at our mutual convenience. Everybody have an outstanding Wednesday. I will see you tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. on the Coffee and Coaches Conference call. You know, once again, we talked about this before as, as far as football, the culture of the weight room in football Right. along with the culture of the quarterback guru and what he's trying to teach. Right. It's almost like it's almost driving guys down toward a path of, you know, inadaptability, right? It's like right. I'm, I'm, I'm compressing in the weight room and I'm trying to teach the guys in box. I'm trying to teach things in boxes and it's, I'm almost driving. The well, you're adding, you're adding unnecessary constraints potentially. Yeah. Right. That become limiting factors rather than enhancing factors. Right. So everybody thinks that more strength would be better. But the reality is, is like, well, how did you achieve that? Because if I need to change the physical shape of a rib cage and I take away a turn that you need it. Right. So so strength training eventually will change the physical shape. All you got to do is like, look at the extremes for a second. It's like, go, go take the world's biggest bodybuilders and you see how wide they are. And then they turn sideways and, and you can see the flattening of the, of the rib cages, right? So that flattening is a reduction in the ability to turn. Now, up to a degree, that increases force production potentially in a favorable way. And then you sort of cross a threshold where it now becomes interference. And so somebody, somebody that you work with may benefit from developing a double body weight back squat that would enhance their ability to throw. Mm -hmm. If you applied that across the board and you said every, if one guy does it, then everybody must need it. And then you just took away somebody else's superpowers because you didn't consider them as an individual as to what they may need. Mm -hmm. right? we can't just, we can't make these blanket applications of method. What we have to do is we have to respect the principles upon which the skill is based. That's what we're talking about. And then you have to say like, okay, what enhances my ability to access that skill and what potentially creates interference for that skill? So for guys that are asking the question now, it's almost like there's a lot of what ifs, right? There's of a course. lot of- There is what ifs. Yeah, it's like, okay, I'm gonna drive force production, but how do I know that threshold of which it's now becoming interference? Right. So I, I guess my question is, we, cause we started, we, we talk about, and you talk a lot about key performance indicators, yes. right? The development yes. of key performance indicators to have objective measures in place to know yes. how you're progressing someone over a base period of time for someone who yes. wants to try and develop some of those things for themselves. What does that look like for a quarterback? 
I don't know. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So here you go. Um, everybody's familiar with getting their blood pressure taken. Uh-huh. Right. And so, so average, average blood pressure tends to fall into that 120 over 80 kind of measurement. Right. So that's the comparator that, that everybody makes. And so, you know, if your numbers are higher than that, then you might be, be qualified as high blood pressure. If your numbers are lower than that, they might say, well, you got low blood pressure. Right. And so they're comparing you to an average, not knowing at all where you might perform best. Cause keep in mind, it's an average. Okay. We do know that we reach a certain threshold and then the, we, we've seen over time because we've been able to measure things over time. They say, you know, if you go 140 over 90 and you're any higher than that, you're probably going to pay a consequence for that. Okay. But we have thousands and millions and millions of measures to go by where we can say things like that. Okay. When we look at individuals on the, on the performance scheme, we don't know what the answer is. It's very gray and it's very complex. That's why we rely on principles and we say, okay, what are the principles that I need? Is there something that I can do to enhance this? And then we do something. So we train them and then we test and we say, what was I trying to impact? Okay. So you have to have an intention first and foremost. So you ask a question, you say, well, I need you to be able to increase your throwing velocity. Okay. So what contributes to velocity? Well, I have to have an excursion of range of motion to access. I have to be able to produce force at a certain place in time. And there is a window of that when you're looking at a throw. And then I say, well, what enhances my ability to produce that force? So do I have sufficient range of motion? I don't know. I don't know what your needs might be. So we measure you and then we do something and we say, well, what happened with our experiment and and did we do something that was favorable? So did we increase throwing velocity? And so we say, yes, we were successful in, in, in in, in improving our throwing velocity. So we're going to continue on that path if more velocity is needed because we've saw that it was successful, but then we remeasure and there's going to be a point in time where we no longer capture more throwing velocity. So adding more strength in the gym will have a a threshold that beyond that doing more doesn't make us better. Okay. So, so we're tracking a number of things over time and we're seeing what changes as we train in regards to the intention that we started with, which was in this case, we're talking about throwing velocity. Yeah. If it's a range of motion problem, we do the exact same thing, but we're tracking a number of things over time. And then we kind of see, well, what's most important? What do we really need to do now? Here's the cool thing with the model that, that, that I've constructed, we have representations of certain behaviors, which people are biased towards. So we know what you're supposed to be good at already. And then we compare that and we say, how does that change over time? What influences that over time? And so we actually have a, we have what the, what the archetypes. So when we talk about people with wide infrastructural angles or narrow infrastructural angles, there's a whole archetype. So, so we're not just looking at that angle as that singular entity. What we're looking at is, like how does this person produce force compared to somebody that has maybe like a more steep helical angle? Um, how does this influence what range of motions that they're going to be biased towards? So your narrow ISA people tend to have more external rotation. So the layback and the, and the end position tends to be a little bit more naturally produced, right? So they're all biased towards certain things. And so we monitor this, these things over time and that's how you do it. You can't just say that, oh, here's the quarterback program because this is this is throwing and then you apply it to everybody the same way we apply the principles the same way but we have to monitor them for change because we don't know what the outcome is going to be somebody might need a lot of strength training somebody might need not not very much at all to make the same effective change because of what they bring to the table all of this all of this is idiosyncratic. So it's very individualized. What we're using is a model to help us determine the best course of interventions. It's the best starting point. And then that allows us to make better decisions along the way.